are so glad to be here. Uh, but before I go any further, I just want to say a great thanks to uh, Pat for making it available. I didn't expect it, didn't anticipate it. I wanted to let him know we were in town, wanted to take him out to lunch. And that worked out really well because he bought lunch. So uh, <laughs> that worked really well. So, <clears throat> But it's always a, a delight to come uh, and, and just be with you guys. And literally, it's been nine months. It seems like it's been longer in some ways, and it seems like it's been shorter some days. Uh, I could spend a lot of time, a lot of people are asking, well, how have you guys been? What's going on? Da, da, da. Uh, I can tell you, uh, Austin is weird, and we're trying not to be, okay? <laughs> uh, I mean, it is like every every liberal... Every liberal and wacko, if you're listening to uh, social media, uh, from California has moved to Austin. And uh, now we are right there with it. So, and, and yeah, now there's a couple of weird ones from Casa Grande that moved in there too. But uh, <clears throat> we're only in town for a couple of days. Uh, we were able to mix some uh, business with pleasure. The pleasure is being able to be with you guys tonight. Well, one thing I did want to say, and I, needed, I found out I needed to say this while we were... Uh, uh, doing worship. If you if you see my eyes getting red or uh, uh, tears while I'm preaching, it's just the COVID. It's just the COVID. So don't worry about. It. <clears throat> tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night. Actually, we're heading back to that uh, the sovereign republic of Texas, and uh, so we're only here just real quick. You know, the significance of this week uh, actually hit me after I had talked with Pat after uh, he had invited me to come and and speak while I was here, and actually. Todd shared with me, uh, after uh, Pat and I got off the phone, she shared with me, because she looked back in her journals, uh, the significance of this month and this week. Uh, first of all, it was actually one year ago this month, and you guys know this, that COVID-19 kind of changed the way we lived, the way we worked, and the way we worshiped. Uh, that was one year ago, and so we've been in this thing now. Uh, how many of you are done with it? You're, you're finished, ready for that? To, okay, <laughs> totally understand. Uh, also, it was March of uh, 2020 that all the uh, shutdowns started happening, uh, began to take place in the state and uh, the nation literally all over the world, and we were part of it. As a matter of fact, it was this very week, a year ago, that I made the announcement to you guys that uh, this would be the last time that we would be meeting publicly for a while. And then we went uh, to online version for quite a while. And praise God, God, by his providential care and plan and purpose, allowed us to bring Eric uh, on board like a year or so before that, almost two years before, and got us all ready for the video to be able to do that, and the ministry continues strong. I can watch Pat and the service uh, in Texas, and uh, we just really enjoy that time. As a matter of fact, we have not had to hunt for a church for o o over 30 years. Now we are in that process of finding a church. For all of those of you who have gone through the process to find a church, uh, blessings to you. Blessings to you. Uh, man, what a difficult thing that is. Because the gospel is not being preached everywhere. The word of God is not being taught everywhere. And it's just amazing what's going on under the banner of Christianity in the world today. So again, we are, we're glad to be here. Uh, also, uh, this month marks actually the 30th anniversary of Calvary Chapel of Casa Grande. It was 30 years ago. Yeah. 30 years ago this month, we started having uh, home Bible studies here in Casa Grande. Uh, and uh, so Todd and I are so excited to be able to see what, that what God began way back then is still continuing on and knowing that he will continue to do it to the completion of his purpose and his will in all of our lives. The work that he's doing here and in our lives even in Texas. But as important and as significant as past history is and should always be, we need to remember that is the past. And we all need to be looking forward to the future of what God has planned and purposed for his glory in each one of our lives. We need to be looking forward to that plan and that purpose that he has for us. Uh, you know, and as he works toward that completion in our lives, uh, you and I can't help but wonder, okay, Lord, what do you have in store? And what's next? 
and none of us can really truly say what that answer is. And really, after COVID, do you want to know the answer? I mean, you know, it could get worse. Do you understand that? You could get worse. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be sharing some things tonight that hopefully will encourage you, but I believe it will also challenge you. Uh, I, I hope and pray that it does both. Let me assure you, even in the midst of all of our personal struggles, all of the sufferings that we have, the heartbreaks, uh, the, the disappointments that come into our lives, along with all the sickness, the death, the trials, all the temptations that hit every one of us, our God will always work all things for his glory. Amen. And that's the promise of his word. And in the midst of what each one of us goes through at different times, at different levels, we need to maintain that. We need to remember that. And there's no one who understood that better than the Apostle Paul. We look at the strength and the majesty of his ministry and how he impacted the world by the power of the Holy Spirit, absolutely, but how the Apostle Paul himself, God used in such a powerful way. And we understand that he knew what struggles and trials and attacks were. As a matter of fact, he tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you don't need to turn there. That's not where the text is. This is just the introduction, so hang in there. Okay, <laughs> Paul told him, he says, I have been flogged. No, I've been in prison more freakly, frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from banks bandits in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and I've toiled and I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and I've often gone without food and I've been cold and naked. Yeah, but you never had COVID. <laughs> So let me ask you, really, how's your week been going as compared, huh? Really, do we have anything to complain about? All of this in Paul's life, he would be the first to say, all of this for the glory of God, for the glory of God. Guys, it's been a tough year. <clears throat> it's been a tough year in many ways for many of us, not just covid but in so many areas, in so many ways. The enemy continues to attack. He desires in every way that he can to bring the believer out of the game because he succeeds when he brings you and I out of the game. Once we profess that we know Christ, our family knows about it, the world knows about it, and suddenly we are pulled out of the game, then the testimony of our life comes null and void. Null and void. And guys, that's why we need to understand. Some, this last year, it's been harder than others. I understand that. But the truth is, the Word of God warns us, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse, much worse, before the day of the Lord's return. So thank you very much, Pastor David, for bringing such an encouraging word tonight, right? So glad that you came all this way just to pump us up. Yeah. I want you to know. Yeah, I believe in the rapture of the church. I believe that, man, one day that trumpet will sound and we will be out of here in the twinkling of an eye. And we'll be changed. But you know what? I also believe that through the history of the church, we know that it can get a whole lot worse than it is right now. I don't care the administration. I don't care politics, economics, world situations. Or it can get a whole lot worse than it can, or than it is right now. So let me ask you this: Who are you personally trusting in? And who are you personally living for? If you're living for yourself, for your good pleasure. Are you trusting in the things that you're able to do or what is provided for you or your strength or your abilities? Beloved, you are going to crash and burn 
Okay, I'm not talking hellfire, crash, and burn. I'm just talking about personally crash and burn. But if you're not trusting in Jesus, that's when we throw the hellfire in there, okay? Because outside of Christ, there is only one other choice, only one other destination. For the believer, our hope is found in the fullness of the gospel message. Our solid, our secure faith comes from the truth of the gospel, the truth that God loved the world so much that he sent his son to be a payment for our sin so that we who were separated from God because of our sin, because of our transgressions, because of the wickedness of our heart, because we were conceived in sin and born with a sinful nature, we were separated from God. Yet God loved us so much that he sent his son There's that COVID thing again. (laughs) He sent his son to be the fullness of the payment that we so desperately needed. Amen? Amen. Amen. And as such, as a believer, our lives need to be lived all for the glory of God. Even in hard and difficult times when troubles and trials and persecution come in like a flood and you feel you are being overwhelmed. Paul understood this as he wrote to a congregation of believers in the middle of the most pagan and godless culture that you and I can imagine. Yes, worse than what we've got going now. Worse than Austin in its worst day. Or California or New York or any place else in the world. One of the worst that there was. And that's the church in Rome. The church in Rome needed to clearly understand that whoever the political party was, whoever the political leader was that was in charge, their help didn't come from a political party or for, from a political leader. The church in Rome needed to understand that no matter how big the stimulus check was, Their help and their provision was not based on the government or the world system. And even through all the pandemics of the ancient world and the persecution from religious leaders and even from the government, the hope and the help of the church had to be from the Lord. And as such, their lives were to be lived for his glory and for his glory alone. Beloved, it's Romans, the book of Romans Chapter 8 is where we're going to be tonight. I shared um, years ago and have in the past many times, I believe, that if you're ever stranded on a desert island, you can only have one book, have the Bible with you. And if you can only have one book of the, the book of books here, have the book of Romans with you. And if you can only have one chapter of that one book, chapter 8 is the one you want to have because there is just so much there. As a matter of fact, there's so much there that we're not going to have time to digest and, uh, and dissect every part of it tonight. There's just so much there. But I pray that the Lord is going to use what I do share all for his glory and for your encouragement. Yes, for your encouragement and for your strength. So as we get into the word, pray with me, would you? Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak your word. I thank you, Father, that we still have the freedom to be able to gather together boldly in the name of Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ can be spoken from our lips without any threats on our lives uh, at, at this present time, at this present place. But Father, we also know that should you tarry, the world has changed before us. How could we be so arrogant as to believe that we would never go through that. Father, keep us strong. Keep us bold. Keep us focused on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It's in his mighty name that we pray. Amen. So Paul writes to the church uh, uh, in Rome, and he writes to you and I, because God used that. It's just as real for you and I today. In chapter 8, and again, we don't have time to go through it all, so I'm asking if you would drop down to verse 18 with me. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul writes, I consider that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. In who? In us as believers. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. As I said, there's so much in this chapter. There's even so much just right there. Uh, I, I can't go into it as deep as I would like to. But let me encourage you. And read this. Read chapter 8 over and over. Study it on your own. Study it with someone. Speak about it with one another. Challenge each other with the word that's here tonight and the, what's here. Read it. Pray about it. Don't just pick out your favorite verse uh, from, from chapter 8 and say, yeah, I love that. No, look at it all and understand how it all flows together to bring about a, a, a whole and, and, and a deep meaning of what Paul's trying to say to the church there. Starting in verse 18, Paul tells us that if we could even begin to compare the coming glory with all the sufferings that are in this world, or compare the sufferings to that coming glory. He said, well, we just can't. There's no way that we can compare the worst of our sufferings with what's yet ahead of us, the glory that awaits us. And as we shared, Paul went through a lot of sufferings. The church was going through a lot of sufferings during this time. And he knew that there was going to be more ahead of that. Paul knew about it. He knew that these were real events, these sufferings, these persecutions for them. But same way for you, just like what you're going through yourself. He knew that there were going to be real attacks, just like you possibly experienced even this past month. Real emotions that people are dealing with, real people, just like you're feeling, and perhaps even tonight, some of the stuff that you're going through. But none of that, guys, none of that suffering, none of those trials are worthy to be compared with the glory, the glory of God that's going to be revealed in us as believers. It's interesting, the word he uses here for suffering Takes in and brings into mind the idea of uh, hardships, of, uh, of pain, afflictions, and sufferings of, of every type, spiritual, emotional, physical. And again, I could go around this room and ask, have any of you gone through some sufferings, spiritual, emotional, or physical, over this last month? And I think that probably every one of us, in a variety of ways, just like COVID hit everybody in a variety of ways, it's absolutely amazing. Every one of us deal with issues in life in a variety of ways. The attacks that are hitting you aren't the ones that are hitting me, but the ones that are hitting me aren't the ones that you're having to deal with. And so each one of us, in our own way, God is, again, working in our lives for his glory. Amen. Whatever trials, whatever kind of tribulations that are going to come your way in this fallen world, you need to understand that when our breath, this, little, this very vapor of, of life is over, you know what? We're going to be ushered into the presence of Jesus forever and ever and ever. We're going to be in the midst of his glory. We're going to be immersed in his majesty. And you know what? We won't even be able to remember the hardness of this life. Because this is a vapor. This is just a moment. And that's eternity. And yet what is so overwhelming to us right now? And yet what is yet before us? The, the hymn writer, years ago, he wrote these words. Some days, or sometimes the day seems long. Our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur. And despair. Amen? Or is that just me? <laughs> but Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears are forever over in God's eternal day. And then the chorus of that song, probably many of you know it. It 
will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Guys, we're not just running a race. We're running a race for the glory of Christ, for the honor of his name. And we're to run it with an intense expectation and an anticipation that soon and very soon he is coming again. Paul tells us that all of creation is waiting, waiting with an earnest expectation. That verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. In other words, for the fulfillment of all that we've been promised. All of creation is waiting for that fulfillment of what has been promised in our life by God's promise to us. And that phrase, the the earnest expectation, it's a long Greek word. I won't even try to pronounce it. It's a compound word. But it's a word picture of like stretching the, the head and the neck forward, looking for something. Looking for something, straining to be able to see or to hear. It, it, it has that idea of a, of a confident expectation, a well-founded hope. You know it's there. You, you, you know it's coming. You're just trying to get a glimpse of it. It's kind of like, you know, when you're kids and uh, dad says, hey, you know, this, this coming Friday when I get home from work, we're loading up the van, kids. And we're heading to Disneyland for like four days. We're going to be at the beach and we're going to be at Disneyland. We're just going to have a blast. You don't think that every little eight-year-old kid is standing at that window or at that door stretching out, waiting to see dad come down the road, ready to take them away? Amen? That's how we ought to be. Our dad's coming. And he's coming to take us away. And so I need to live my life. You need to live your life. We need to live our lives with that earnest expectation. Any day now, any day. In a very real and practical way, even creation itself is going to be delivered from the curse of sin and death on that final day of Christ's return. And maybe Paul was referring to that new heaven and the, the new earth where righteousness dwells that, that Peter talks about in Second Peter. You know that one, no more weeds, no more thorns, no more earthquakes, no more tornadoes, no more s- snowmageddon. Is that what we called it yeah, in Texas a couple of weeks ago? No, you know, uh, no more uh, uh, droughts, no more floods. All the tsunamis, all the volcanoes are going to be done away with. No more pollution, no more pestilence, no more plagues, and no more pandemics. They'll all be a thing of the past. And the earth is again released from the curse of sin. Because you see, it's under the same curse right now because of sin. But for now, guys, all of that's here. We're living in a fallen world, and we are fallen creatures, and we have to deal with those kinds of things. The the world, even in her groaning, in her labor pangs, holds on to that expectant hope, that earnest expectation for the return of Jesus. But it isn't just creation who has that earnest expectation. You and I. We need to have that earnest expectation. We need to get uncomfortable with this temporary world and more comfortable with the reality of the coming of eternity. We need to have that eternity in our hearts that the word tells us, man, God gave it to us. And we need to start recognizing it and having it in our mind. Oh, man, these troubles, they're real. They're true. There's no doubt. People are dying. People are suffering. There's absolutely no doubt. But guys, this is not the end game. This is not the end of it. Go on with me or you'll never get finished here. Uh, Look at verse 23. 
He says, not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, we groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, for we were saved in this hope, in this hope. And he says, but hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Okay, it's kind of like, okay, I, I, I hope, uh, how do I, how would I put it? Well, we're coming to uh, Casa Grande this week. I hope Pat lets me teach. Well, I don't need to hope for that anymore, do I? It's happening. It's here. Well, we hope for the coming adoption, the fulfillment of our redemption. We're hoping for that. It's not here yet, guys. We are in the temporary. It's in faith that we eagerly wait for the adoption. Right now, we live in the fullness of hope, that hope of redemption. We live with the hope of the resurrection. We, uh, All of us, we should be eagerly waiting with expectation and with perseverance. Guys, it's not here yet. And I know theologically, and according to God's promise, we can say we are saved, we are redeemed. I don't know about you, but I'm still in the flesh. I still suffer. I still have pain. Just a news blast, I still fail. You know what? It's not completed yet. I'm still waiting for that. In my mind, in my understanding, because I'm still temporary, it's yet to be. But you know what? We are called to wait in perseverance. And that word perseverance, again, that, that, that's not just a grin and bear it. Oh, one day it'll come and I'll just kind of suffer through. No, it's not a grin and bear it kind of an attitude that we're supposed to say. Again, going back to the Greek, it has that understanding of continuing on or being devoted to, to stay, to remain to the end. As a matter of fact, one commentator puts it this way. He says, when that word is used in the New Testament, it speaks of the characteristic of a man or a woman who is not swerved from their deliberate purpose and their loyalty to faith and godliness by even the greatest of trials and sufferings. That's perseverance. We hold on to the purpose and the direction that we've been called to. And through every bit of suffering and trials, we continue to be loyal to faith and godliness in our lives, even though the world around us is becoming more and more ungodly as the days go on. You and I are to persevere, not grin and bear it, but with a focused purpose continuing on. We're to persevere in that faithful trust and that obedience to Christ until the end. Eternity waits yet ahead. But for now, as I said, we're in this temporary dwelling place. It's, this isn't our home. Our journey isn't complete yet. Not in our timetable. But beloved, you need to understand that in God's timetable, it's all complete. In God's mind, God's understanding, God's eye, it is done. It is a done deal. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 26, we are already seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Already there. Because that's the mind and the purpose of God. But in our time frame, it's not fully complete yet. We still live by faith, trusting in the unseen. We live in expectation because he who promised is faithful. We live with perseverance because these trials are a part of the Christian life. They are a promised part, by the way. You know, sometimes some of you might have those promises of God that you pull out every morning and kind of get encouraged about it. I mean, you know, I've never seen one of those packets of promises of God that you pull it out and says, in this world, you'll have many tribulations. But you know what? That is a promise of God. That's a promise of Christ to the disciples. In this world, you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. But you're still going to have tribulations. We're still going to have trials. That's just the reality of being in a fallen world at this point in time. That's why we have to keep focused 
in the midst of all the pain, all the suffering of these temporary carcasses that we're carrying around, We need to keep focused on the glory and the splendor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the hope that is the gospel. In perseverance, we need to hold on to that earnest expectation, looking forward to that great and glorious day of his appearing when we will see clearly that, as he says in verse 18, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Because, beloved, when he comes, it will be glorious. And it's all for his glory. Beloved, right now, Today, in, in, in the world that we're living, we have to continue to set our minds on Christ, set our minds on the glory of God in our lives. And when we do that, the issues of this world will have less and less control over us. When we are more focused on Christ than on this world, then the world has less hold to us and less control over us. When we're focused on living our lives to the glory of God, then living our lives for the things of this world and the things of this flesh become less and less important because living my life for his glory has now become the utmost. Continue to set our minds on Christ and the glory of God in order that the issues of the world will have less and less control over us. But if instead, and here's the warning, if we continue to remain focused on this world, the allurements, the temptations, or even the pain and the suffering of this world, you know what? We're going to miss seeing the glory of God. And we're going to miss finding that promised peace that passes all understanding. Why? Because I'm so focused on the pain. And we all have pain. And some is a lot worse than others. I understand that. And I'm not lessening that. But I'm telling you that according to God's word, the strength that we find is in him. Not in my perfect health check mark when I go to the doctor. Or my, um, what's that rate that I'm always checking? Our credit rate. Uh, yeah, it's not in our credit rate, you know. You could be a 800 and whatever. It, Man, if your peace is only found in that, those things can change in a moment, in a moment. Our focus in him is in him. Guys, even if we go through all this stuff in the fallen world, and guys, again, there's a lot of stuff we're going through. As we go through it, I want you also to know, help, I, I want you to understand that I understand that it is a rightful and it is a proper prayer to pray even as David prayed multiple times in the Psalms. Psalm 57 is one example. You can write it down. I'm just going to speak a couple of verses. But Psalm 57, just one of, of many examples that are found throughout the Psalms. David writes in Psalm 57, verse 1, he says, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make refuge until, what, these calamities pass or pass by and he says my soul is among lions i lie among the sons of men who are set on fire whose teeth are sharp or or, i'm sorry whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword well that's kind of a negative confession david you ever heard somebody say, hey, don't, don't make any negative confessions. Always speak positive things. Guys, that's voodoo and new age. God wants you to speak the truth. Guess what? He's big enough to hear the truth. God, I'm hurting. God, this situation. I'm drowning. I need you. And my hope is in you. That's what David says. Because after all that, he says, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. 
Throughout the Psalms, David honestly declared the reality of his situation. He continually, though, returns his focus to the glory of God. And church, this is the only way you're going to be able to stand, to be honest before God, but also give him the glory and the praise in all things. Remember Job's wife? He said, why don't you just curse God and die? Yeah, nobody wants to pray for a wife like that or a husband like that, okay? But what was Job's word? Shall I accept good from God and not the bad? He says, God is still God no matter what's going on. Job wanted to give honor and glory to God, whatever took place in his life. It's the only way you and I will be able to stand is when we stand for the glory of God and do it with that earnest expectation. This isn't all there is. I know that he's coming soon. It's a rightful thing. It's honest before God to declare, to confess to him the troubles and the pain that you're going through. God sees already. He understands your hearts already. But we need also to, to declare our, our, our true faith and our complete trust in him every day throughout the day. Once again, listen to the words of David. This is another psalm, Psalm 69. But these are just a couple of samples. This has got to be real quick. David says, he says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I've come into deep waters where the floods overwhelm me. I'm weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. And I believe that some of you tonight can say, right along with David, these words. Either tonight you can say them, or you can say them two months ago. Or beloved, you might be saying them a week or a month from now. But that's an honest declaration of these feeble lives that we live. This is just flesh. But you know what? David doesn't leave it there. He says, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Oh, let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. So God, this is a mess that I'm going in, and I'm about to die, but you are a great God. You're an awesome God, and my trust is in you. That's the honesty of our hearts and lives, guys. That gets us back into focus. That allows us to have peace in the midst of the storm. That allows us to be able to weather those storms and those trials that come our way and keep our focus correct. I know we're not as eloquent as David. I mean, let's face it. There's, there's times when we're so overwhelmed with, with, with what's going on in our lives, we can't even put two words together, much less two thoughts. And I think that's why Paul gives us further encouragement back here in Romans 8. Look at verse 26. Verse 20 says, 26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we don't even know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for who, church? For the saints, for you and I. According to whose will? The will of God. Do you realize what an awesome gift of God's grace that is? The Holy Spirit himself, who is abiding within the lives of every believer, interceding, on our behalf. Not only is he personally acquainted with all of our personal situations, our weaknesses, our struggles, our doubts, all of our failings, but you know what? He knows the mind of God and the will of God on our behalf. And so he intercedes on our behalf according to the will of God. Really, how, how cool is that? The one who knows everything about us. 
is praying for us. <clears throat> Can't tell you how, how blessed we are, Todd and I, whenever we hear from folks that, hey, we're praying for you guys, we're praying for you guys. When we were here in ministry for all those years, to know that many of you faithfully, regularly were praying for us and how great that was. But you know what? <clears throat> as, as cool as that was and as great and as encouraging as that was, you guys had no clue what to pray for. You really had no clue of what all was going on in our lives. But we still needed your prayers. Don't, don't, don't let me discount that. But the one who knows everything come on, come on. Yeah. is interceding. On our behalf. But there's also another one that intercedes for us. Look down a little bit further. We're going to skip real, real quick down to verse 34. Paul also says that it's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who what? Also makes intercession for us. The Holy Spirit abiding within us. Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, at the right hand throne of God. Both of them interceding on our behalf. That is the blessed hope of the gospel, y'all. Okay? Whether you're from Texas or Ohio, it doesn't matter. That is the blessed hope. Christ, who died for our sins on our behalf, is also praying for us before the Father. Not only does the abiding presence of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer, continue to intercede for us, but God the Father, who reconciled us to himself through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, also listens to the intercession of his only Son on our behalf. You think he listens to his only son? Oh, yeah. Talk about getting the father's ear. The only son has the father's ear, and he's praying for you. And he knows exactly what you're going through. He knows your weaknesses. <coughs> Excuse me. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your strengths. He knows your failings. He knows your victories. He knows the struggles, and he knows the joy. And he's praying on your behalf. The very one who took our place of suffering and death because of our sin, because of our rebellion against the Father, he's continually pleading our case before the Father. Not because we deserve it, but because of his great love for us. Because God so loved the world. And that includes you and me. So my question to you tonight, have you truly and fully received his promise of forgiveness that he offers freely to whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord? And if you haven't received that promise, my question to you is, why? Why would you reject such a great love that the Father offers? Not because we deserve it, I don't have to clean myself. I don't have to go take a shower to take a bath. No, I come to him, as the old hymn says, just as I am, just as I am. And he says, I'll take you where you're at, and I'll clean you from the inside out by the blood of my son. And if you are his child, the question is, is are you living with that earnest expectation? that earnest expectation of the fulfillment of all things. If you have and you are, then the promise of the word on your behalf, God is working out for his glory. When we're in the middle of all these temporary struggles, and every one of them are temporary, I don't care if it's been a lifelong struggle, you need to understand, it's temporary. It's not eternal. It may feel like eternal while you're in it, but it's temporary. 
when we're in the middle of these temporary struggles, these temporary trials, his promise remains true. Look at verse 28. <clears throat> Somebody's been saying, well, I was hoping he'd get to this verse <laughs> before he died in the pulpit. <clears throat> Tell you what, if, when I die, I'd, I'd love dying at this place. Amen, Pat. Uh, what better place? I'm probably not messing up at this point in time, so uh, this is a, this would be a great place. Verse 28. For we know, and I love that assurance. Paul says, we know. Not we hope. No, Paul says, no, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified." Guys, that is the work of God through every process of salvation. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it to every part of that, the completion of it. There's so much there. But we cannot take verse 28. We know that all things work together for good. We cannot take that verse and fully and faithfully interpret it without putting it in the context of all of Romans chapter 8. And then we need to place Romans chapter 8 in the context of all of the book of Romans, and we need to take Romans and put it in the context of the entire word of God and into the life of all the patriarchs and all the forefathers of our faith. We look at something like the, in the chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. We see so many that God used in so many powerful way, ways. Frail men and women, men and women who lost their lives, who went through many trials and sufferings, some that were sawn under, some that were in prison. God works all things together for good to those that are his, who are called according to his purpose. All in order that he could show his great glory and mercy through the testimony of his children. He knew them before they were ever formed in the womb of their mothers. He had a preordained plan and purpose for their lives, all according to his will and his purpose. He called you to himself. He has justified you through the sacrifice of Christ, not through any merit of your own. And he did it all in order that your souls would be glorified on that great day of his appearing. Folks, it's not here yet, but we wait with earnest expectation. We wait for that great day. Charles Spurgeon it is morning and evening devotion. I just read this, uh, I think yesterday morning. I thought, wow, that's exactly where I'm going. Part of that devotion, he says, we bless God then for our afflictions. We thank him for our changes. We extol his name for losses of property. For we feel that if he had not chastened us in this way, we might have become too secure. Continued worldly prosperity is a fiery trial. Well, I thought if God loved me, he would cause me to prosper. No, the word says that if God loves you, he will discipline you. A loving father disciplines his children. He also says that he'll be with us always. The title of that from Spurgeon was The Benefit of Affliction. And we don't, I don't want to hear that. I, I, I want to hear, you know, God loves me and he has a wonderful plan for my life and he wants me to live my best life right now. Well, beloved, if this is your best life right now, then I fear for you for eternity. And I believe that the gospel that, or the non-gospel that's being preached in the world today is bringing damnation to a lot of people that believe that if God loves them, that everything's going to be wonderful and fine. That's not the case. 
All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And we're getting into a world that is not friendly to the word of God, to the cause of Christ, or to the followers of Christ. And beloved, if you're not ready for it, then woe be unto you. Because there will be no peace. There will be no comfort. The only way that you and I are going to be able to have the peace and the comfort that comes from Christ is by getting our eyes off the things of this world and getting our eyes looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the prize that was before him, he endured the shame. How about the prize that's before you? Are you willing to endure the trials, the persecution that come our way? You and I as believers, being born again by the Spirit of God, need to put Romans 8.28 in every area of our lives. The good things, the bad things, the hard things, the things that, wow, this is awesome, God. Every part of it. You need to put it in our failures, in our victories. Even when it's certain that, that, that life here is never going to be the same. Because we have that very same calling and promise in our lives as those that have gone before us, that have gone through so much before us. That's the importance of you and I knowing and understanding history. And we're in a culture right now that's trying to wipe out history. But you know what? Even as the church, too many times I think we try to wipe out history. We need to remember God's faithfulness. Not just the faithfulness of 30 years here at Calvary Chapel of Casa Grande, as faithful as God has been through all the ups and downs of it, but for generations and millennia before us, God is continually working through this fallen world and the frailty of fallen man to accomplish his purpose and plan. So whatever you're going through this evening, or whatever you've gone through this past month or this past year, or whatever you're going to be going through this coming year, remember these two great truths. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. With earnest expectation, all of creation eagerly waits for the completion of all things. You and me, because we say we have faith in the truth of God's word and in the promises given through Christ, we need to be eagerly waiting with that same earnest expectation for the completion of his plans and purposes. And as we wait, we can't be as those that sit and cry, woe is me. There is a victory that is ours in Christ that we need to fully realize. And we need to realize the fullness of that victory and walk in. Let's close it up with this. Listen as Paul writes here, finishing out this section, verse 31. He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, do you realize the strength of that declaration right there? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword did you notice that all of these things are temporary? And in most cases, momentary. That's why you and I, we have to have our hearts and our minds set on eternity. 
all for the glory of God. He says, as it's written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, what does it say, church? We are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Guys, we eagerly and earnestly await that glorious eternity where we'll be seated at the feet of our Lord Jesus in the presence of Father God. Ours is the future hope and the completion of all things. And if you've read the end of the book, you know there will come that time that God's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more death and no more sorrow, no more crying. There'll be no more pain. They'll, for the former things that passed away, including COVID and a whole lot of other things, there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be written on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Church, don't be overcome by present trials. Know that the love of the Father watches over you and will always be with you. And as you and I truly persevere and give glory to Almighty God and let His presence and glory fill our lives, we will know that perfect peace. We will know that comfort beyond all comfort, more so than anything that the world can give. Live with that earnest expectation of his soon return. Get your eyes off this world and get your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word, for the power of your word, for the hope of your word, for the peace that comes in knowing that your word is true and not a word of it shall ever fail. And your promises are true. And Lord, you are not a man that you would lie. And so we hold on to the hope of that promise. The promises that you give, that this is but for a moment, but your desire for us is for eternity. Let us live our lives for your glory and for the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you guys stand, please? He didn't say that all things are good. Because let's face it, there's a lot of stuff in this world that's not good. A lot of stuff that we go through that's not good, not pleasant, not desirous at all. But he says he's going to take every mess, every garbage, every, every pain, every sorrow, he's going to work it out to good. To who, church? Those that love him. Those that are called upon his name. What about you tonight? Are you here tonight and you know that in the very core of your life you love the Lord Jesus? Oh, that doesn't mean you're perfect. I, I've looked around the room. I haven't found a perfect one at all, including up on this stage. I've, no, me, not me. But where is our heart? Have we received the promise of God that if you come unto me, and he'll never reject you. He wants to give you life tonight. And if you're here tonight and you don't know that life, we're going to sing in just a moment. And I'm going to invite you, if you would. I'm going to ask Pastor Robert if he'd come on up and, uh, uh, and he'd be available for prayer. And Pat, why don't you come on up too? You can come on up here. And we'll just see. You might, you might be here tonight and you just need to say, man, I need to, I need to refocus because I've been overwhelmed by the things of this world. Whatever your prayer need is tonight, whatever the desire of your heart, let God minister to you tonight.